One day in a remote Roman province, a troublemaker was crucified, a routine occurrence under Roman occupation, especially in as febrile a place as Judea. Not the sort of thing anyone would take much note of, except for the dead man's family and friends. Certainly no historian bothered to record when it happened. But this troublemaker was Jesus of Nazareth, and his death set in train events that would shape the whole world, as the movement which he inspired became a world-spanning religion. But with so many details of his life obscure and uncertain, can we pin down this one? Can we actually figure out when he died? Well, with a bit of historical analysis and even some astronomy, it turns out that we can, right down to the day. Our sources for the story of Jesus' death are the four Gospels of the Christian Bible. The good news, no pun intended, is that all four Gospels give us the date when Jesus was put to death. The bad news is, first, they don't give us the year, and second, they don't even all give us the same date. But let's start with what they do agree on. Jesus went with his followers to Jerusalem in the run-up to Passover. He was arrested, brought before the local Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, was condemned to death and crucified. They also all agree that Jesus died on the day before the Sabbath, that is to say on a Friday. The Passover period lasts a week, so that's just one possible Friday per year. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Pilate was governor from 26 to 36 AD, so that gives us at most 11 Fridays to choose from. We can narrow this down a bit, though. The Gospels agree that Jesus started his public career being baptised by John the Baptist. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that John the Baptist started preaching and baptising people in the 15th year of the Roman Emperor Tiberius. In our terms, that's the year 29 AD. So that narrows down our timescale a bit, knocking out three possible Fridays and leaving us with just eight. From here on in, though, it gets tricky. There are four Gospels, but really only two versions of the story of the death of Jesus. Mark, Matthew and Luke all tell essentially the same story. Mark was the first to be written, and Matthew and Luke based their narrative closely on his, although with some embellishments. That's one version. The other version is in the Gospel of John. It differs from the others in quite a few details, and clearly the writer was basing his account on some other source, or incorporating other material. The most important difference, as far as we're concerned, is the date. Mark, Matthew and Luke all say that Jesus was put to death on the day of Passover. In the Hebrew calendar, that's the 15th of Nisan. John says it happened on the day of preparation for Passover. That's the day before, the 14th of Nisan. So, which to believe? Well, we can start by looking closely at the different accounts and seeing if one is more credible than another. Let's start with Mark, Matthew and Luke. In this version, Jesus has a Passover meal with his disciples. Later that night, he goes with them to the Garden of Gethsemane, just outside Jerusalem. There he is arrested. His disciples scatter. He's taken directly to the Jewish ruling body, the Sanhedrin, where he is put on trial for blasphemy. The following morning, the Jewish leaders hand him over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, insisting that he be put to death. After some humming and hawing and egged on by an angry crowd, Pilate agrees to do so. He has Jesus crucified in the morning, and Jesus died on the cross around 3pm the same day. Now some of this is quite reasonable. Arresting him at night makes sense, if you want to catch him and his followers literally napping. And it's likely that the Jewish authorities didn't have the power at this time to pass a death sentence, so they have to bump the issue up to the Roman governor. The whole business with Pilate having to be urged by the Jews to crucify Jesus is probably a later invention, but that's by the by. But when we look more closely, some oddities start to appear. Jesus is arrested at night, fair enough. He's then taken immediately, during the night, to be tried by the Sanhedrin, except in Luke, where they wait till morning. This is the ruling body of the Jewish people. 71 men acting as government, civil service and supreme court all at once. Just getting them all together at short notice in the middle of the night is a 
bit of a reach. And on top of that, it's Passover. These guys have plenty to be getting on with, whether it's in the temple or with their families. But okay, let's say it's an urgent matter. Somehow they put all that aside. There's still the matter of Jewish law, which said that you can't carry out a trial on the Sabbath or a feast day, including Passover. So we have the highest authority of the Jewish establishment not only convening in a rush at night during one of their most important festivals, but also ignoring its fundamental laws, laws that their predecessors had fought wars to preserve. And all this just to deal with one criminal who is already in custody. What's the rush? It's not like he's going anywhere. They then take Jesus to Pilate the next morning, which is fair enough, although the Gospel of Luke also has them sending him back and forth to Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, who's in town for Passover. It's quite reasonable that he would be around on that day, but this is more and more very senior people acting at very short notice to deal with one troublemaker. And according to the Gospel of Mark, they get all this done before 9am. The sense of urgency here is just very hard to believe. So, Mark, Matthew and Luke all have a story that just doesn't seem all that credible. But how about John? Jesus, again, is arrested at night. But there's no trial, no meeting of the Sanhedrin. Instead, Jesus is questioned by Annas, a former high priest, and the father-in-law of the current high priest, Caiaphas. This is immediately a lot more plausible. Annas is the sort of senior and respected figure who would deal with these sorts of troublesome issues. The outcome of this brief inquiry, which is not a trial, is that the Jewish leaders send Jesus to Pilate as a political agitator. Pilate briefly questions him, again hums and haws a bit and puts the issue to the crowd, before sending Jesus to be crucified about noon. Now, compared to the previous version, this narrative is much less problematic, has a lot less going on in a short period of time, and is generally more plausible. Whatever source John is using has preserved an account of these events that seems more realistic, more workable, and more in tune with what we know of Jewish practices at this time from other historical sources. The question is, if John is a more reliable narrator about these events, does that mean he's also more reliable about the date? That feels like a reasonable supposition, but it's impossible to say for sure from the historical sources alone. But there is one other way we can try to figure this out, and it involves astronomy. The Western calendar that we use today is derived from the Roman calendar. It's a solar calendar. The year is defined by the motion of the sun in the sky. The Hebrew calendar is lunar solar. It depends on the motions of both the sun and the moon. Converting between these involves some astronomical modelling. Each month of the Hebrew calendar begins at the start of the lunar cycle with the new moon. Now, these days, of course, the Hebrew calendar is based on astronomical calculations. But in ancient times, the beginning of the month was set by actually observing that first faint visible crescent of the moon which can be a tricky task. So if you want to figure out which day of the week corresponded to a particular date in ancient times, and if you're using the Hebrew calendar, you need to do some fairly complex astronomical calculations. You need to calculate the phases of the moon. You need to estimate atmospheric conditions that might affect the visibility of the crescent, and so on. Fortunately, this has been done by Colin Humphreys and W.G. Waddington of Oxford University. And what they found was terribly interesting. Going by John's account, where Jesus dies on Friday the 14th of Nisan, and looking between the years 29 and 36, we find two possible dates. Friday the 7th of April in the year 30, and Friday the 3rd of April in the year 33. But if we go with Mark, Matthew and Luke, and try to find a year within this time frame when the 15th of Nisan falls on a Friday, there just isn't one. We've already seen that John's account of these events seems more plausible than the other Gospel writers. Now, astronomy has told us the same thing. A 2,000-year-old historical problem solved by hard science. Well, almost solved.
We still have a choice of two dates. Some people have speculated that astronomy can tell us which one is right. It comes down to a passage in the Acts of the Apostles, where we're told that the Apostle Peter gave a sermon in which he quoted the prophet Joel, saying, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Now, it so happens there was a lunar eclipse on the 3rd of April, 33, the second of our two dates, and in a lunar eclipse, the moon turns red. But before we get all excited, it doesn't really work. In terms of astronomy, Bradley Schaefer of NASA did the detailed calculations, and he concluded that this lunar eclipse was essentially not visible from Jerusalem. By the time the full moon rose over the horizon that evening, the eclipse would have been almost over and not visible to the naked eye. And in any case, there's a wider point. We have to be careful not to fall into the trap of taking poetic language literally. This verse also says that the sun would be darkened, which sounds like a solar eclipse. Except that you can't have a lunar and a solar eclipse in the same day, because one happens at the full moon and the other happens at the new moon. It has been speculated that maybe there happened to be a sandstorm that day that darkened the sun and reddened the moon. Now, that's possible. But if so, it doesn't help us at all with the date. And in any case, this whole passage is most likely just poetic imagery. It's literary, not literal. So that's as far as science will take us. But we can look at these two Fridays and decide which is more plausible. Jesus died in either 30 or 33. We don't know exactly when he started his public career. Luke tells us that John the Baptist started preaching in 29 AD, and we know Jesus got started after that. So if he died in 30, that gives him barely a year to start his movement and grow it to the point where it was seen as a threat by the authorities. But if he died in 33, that gives three or four years for that process to unfold. Now, scholars have debated the length of Jesus' ministry literally for millennia. I'm not going to unpack it all here, but suffice to say that the narrative in the Gospel of John shows a ministry lasting around three years. The other Gospels could pack all their action into a single year, but there's no reason why they have to. It's fair to say that the consensus of scholars is that Jesus was active in preaching for around three years after his encounter with John the Baptist. And that's nothing new. Even back in the fourth century, major Christian writers like Eusebius and Epiphanius were saying the same thing. So I think we can quite comfortably say, based on history and science, that Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross on Friday the 3rd of April, 33 AD. Maybe around three in the afternoon. As for what happened next, that's a whole other story. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see more, then like and subscribe. And if you want to support me in making more of these videos, then visit my Patreon at the link below for special bonus material and the opportunity to suggest topics for future videos.